everybody. Um, my name is Rachel Beyer, and I'm the John W. Emery Family Assistant Curator of Oral History here at History Colorado. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started uh, because I'm so excited to um, I'm so excited to be with you here today to um, to talk about holidays at home. Um, I'd like to uh, before we even begin, I'd like to to start off by acknowledging the land on which I'm giving this presentation. In the spirit of healing and education, we acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribes with historic ties to the state of Colorado. These tribes are our partners. We consult with them when we plan exhibits, collect, preserve, and interpret artifacts, do archaeological work, and create educational programs. We recognize the indig these indigenous peoples as the original inhabitants of this land. So in 1910, the Aspen Times posted this advertisement on the left of your screen that says, spend the holidays at home. Special low rates to and from all points in Colorado and New Mexico via Denver and Rio Grande, the scenic line of the world. This is kind of ironic because this ad is encouraging commercial travel, even if it's close to home, at a time that, during a time that for more than a century was a holiday celebrated in the company of family in one's own home. So tonight we're actually gonna talk about how in the early 20th century, the modern world was increasingly showing its influence in the lives of Americans all over the country. That is the ethnic, religious, and cultural traditions that previously dominated holiday celebrations began to give way to a shared holiday. And that holiday was a Christmas centered around and gift giving. That's not to say that, that religious services or cultural or ethnic traditions went away, but what it, what it means to say is that newspapers, magazines, and billboards begin to advertise toys, ornaments, packaged food products, and other Christmas goodies that could be purchased in any small town or large city across the United States. And so we start this emergence of a, a full package version of what would become an Americanized Christmas. So tonight we're gonna to roll back to not the 1910s when all of these things started to merge together, these commercial products along with the, the new age of advertising to see what this Christmas experience began to look like for millions of Americans across the land. So what I wanna do is I actually wanna take us through the experience of preparing for a Christmas uh, in the 1910s. So let's start off in our homes uh, we're in our, you know, many of us last weekend decorated, uh, you know, over the Thanksgiving weekend, we got out our boxes of Christmas ornaments, and in the 1910s, folks would have done the same. Everything that I show is either, either a, uh, something from our collection or something from the Colorado Historic Newspapers Project. So everything tonight is accessible through History Colorado, should you want to take a, a better look at it. So first of all, let's decorate our, let's decorate our tree. Uh, we've got a, a string of glass beads uh, on the left. In the center, we have something pretty cool. This is these were manufactured in a plant uh, or a, a commercial plant. Um, and what these are are Christmas tree candle holders. So uh, if you look at the pink one on the top in the center of the screen, that, that part on the left would be the little would be a spring clip holder. So you would squeeze that and you'd be able to attach it to the tree. And on the right of that pink one, you see kind of a little prong sticking out. That's where you would have set, stuck your candle in. So you would have put all of your, your candle holders on the tree and then put your candles in and then lit them. Uh, and we have this in multiple colors in the collection. We've got uh, uh, pink and green and blue. Um, and on the right, we have some ornaments. Uh, these were also would have been made in factories. We've got a star ornament in the upper right and a heart ornament in the lower, in the lower right. So once you've decorated your tree and you have all of your accoutrements ready, in the 1910s, you maybe hired somebody to come in and take a photograph of you and your family in all of your Christmas decoration glory. Uh, this photograph was made, uh, was a, this photograph was taken by H.H. Buckwalter. Uh, we have a, quite a few of his photographs in our collection. And here we have a middle-class family, somewhere around our time period, who are 
uh, you can see the dad uh, and at least one of the kids gazing uh, adoringly up at the tree. Uh, dad maybe is making sure that the tree isn't catching on fire because of all those candles. Um, but we have the whole family sitting in front of the tree and uh, along with uh, an ornamented mantelpiece uh, to, the, to the right of the tree. So we have people starting to want to commemorate their celebration of Christmas through photographs. Now, you could hire somebody to come and take your photograph, but also by the 1910s, you could take it yourself. Because in 1909, Kodak introduces the folding pocket Kodak camera. And, uh, and so people could now uh, much more easily take a photograph uh, of their own Christmas celebration, perhaps very much like this, uh, perhaps very much like this photograph on the right. Um, here we have an unnamed photographer, so this very well could have been taken by a family. Uh, with their own uh, with their own camera. Uh, this is from a family who lived in Idaho Springs. And we see an ornamented tree. And in front of that tree, we see lots and lots of toys. Uh, we, see, um, we see a doll in a wicker bassinet, a croquet set, a miniature pottery bowl, a chamber, uh, even a little chamber pot. Um, there's a serving dish and doll furniture. There's actually two books in this photograph. We can't see them very well, but the books are titled Kids of Many Colors and Lives of the Hunted. And then there's also more presents on top of the wooden dresser next to the tree. There is doll furniture, a photo album, and a picture frame, along with uh, some clothing, a tie, socks, caps, and gloves, and a checkerboard on the mantelpiece, which, which you can see in the upper left-hand corner, that distinctive black and white checkerboard. So lots and lots of people are, um, are celebrating their holidays in, in a similar way to each other. Now, once you've gotten your home decorated, uh, now maybe it's time to sit down and, and send out your Christmas cards. Uh, today, we often, uh, some, I, we've kind of started to move back a little bit to the postcard. It's a lot of people use Shutterfly and stuff to, um, to print some of their family photos and send out postcards. Uh, we've used Christmas cards for a long time. Back in the 1910s, postcards were all the rage. Everybody had to send Christmas postcards, and there were hundreds of Christmas postcards to choose from. Uh, include, including uh, cats. Apparently, Americans have always loved cats. Now we have cat memes and cat gifts and all that kind of stuff. Back then, they had cat postcards. So we have cats in the upper left-hand corner. We have uh, in the center, St. Nicholas with a little girl. Uh, in the upper, uh, ch young children on post uh, Christmas postcards have been a, a very long favorite. Uh, up in the upper right-hand corner, you have elves. They have little pointy ears. Uh, and there's some mushrooms. It's more of a fant fantasy scene. And uh, in the, it says Christmas greetings. And in the lower right, you have four little children along with the poem, I don't like you a bit because you said there ain't no Santa Claus. And, uh, and most of these postcards actually uh, come from, uh, were donated by a woman named Mabel DeWolf. And so on the back of the cat card, it says from grandpa to Mabel. Uh, and the Santa Claus card on the back says, a Merry Christmas to you and a Happy New Year uh, to, to Mabel. And from, uh, from uh, a book that was written on entertaining, uh, Madame Mary, uh, a pen name, uh, Madame Mary said, the saddest thing in this world is to be forgotten. So let us sit down this very day and make out our list, get our notes and our postcards ready, which the postman will deliver and gladden to those whom the Christmas mail will mean much or little according as we remember. Now, of course, if you're a kid, Christmas without toys is, uh, you know, not quite the same. And this is the, the 1910s is when we start seeing commercial toys really, really becoming um, not just very popular, toys that are made in factories become very popular, but also um, being ad highly advertised. So, um, so here in the upper, or, um, so in 1914, an article in the Norwood Post uh, was written uh, uh, entitled Children and Old Fashioned Toys. And the article says, children display the same quaint, simple, old fashioned taste as their grandparents did as children, rather than the inclination of their parents to buy them fancy toys full of mechanical gadgets. The article continued, automobiles and miniature may fascinate a small boy for a few hours, but you'd better place your faith in a good old pattern rocking horse. And as for dolls, you've got to give them real baby dolls and not grand fancy ladies in the latest gowns and hats. 
The article concludes with something I find very funny, and I think that would uh, that the author of this article would find very fitting today. And he and the article the author says sometimes I think that a manufacturer could make a fortune selling toys just for grown-ups, uh, which I really love that ending because we have lots of toys for grown-ups now. And here we have some of the pieces from our collection that are mentioned in this article. We have one of these, uh, what did they call it? Uh, fancy toys full of mechanical gadgets in the upper left-hand corner. We have a, a wind-up um, police car uh, toy. And in the lower uh, left, we have one of those uh, good old-fashioned rocking horses along with the baby doll in the center. And then on the right is the, is the advertisement illustration that accompanied this article. So here we have a boy on the hobby horse, almost like the one we have in our collection. And we have the girl with baby dolls and a book rather than, um, rather than what did they call them? Grand ladies in the, in the latest gowns. However, these were not the most popular toy of the 1910s. The most popular toy by the end of the 1910s was Raggedy Ann. Raggedy Ann was patented by Johnny Gruel in 1915 but didn't get really popular until three years later when Gruel published Raggedy Ann's stories. So once there was a book to accompany the doll, she became really popular. Now this version of Raggedy Ann um, comes from our collection. She's a small rag doll. She has a face that's drawn on white cloth with colored pencil and an orange yarn hair. And she wears this hand-stitched pink uh, gingham dress with a white lace apron over the top. The dress has a little snap on the back, and then she has legs that are red and white stripes with black shoes. And she actually has undergarments as well uh, that, are, that are white cotton drawers. Now, Raggedy Ann is a perfect example of our, of our old tradition meets new tradition that we're talking about tonight. Because she looks homemade, but she was actually made in a factory. So here we have this toy that looks like it was made by hand, but was made in a factory. And by 1920, Jets in Leadville was advertising Raggedy Ann and was saying, Raggedy Ann and Raggedy Ann dolls are for sale at this store only. That if you wanted a Raggedy Ann doll for your child, uh, you were gonna have to go to Jets in Leadville. Manufacturers and dry goods stores and, uh, and other stores uh, that sold groceries and markets and places like that um, were really trying to attract the attention of primarily mothers who did the shopping um, to, to save a little bit of money uh, on Christmas gifts for their children by, um, by buying a certain, amount of, a certain amount of goods at the store and then getting a free um, gift to go, along with, um, to go along with that purchase. So very much like a premium. So here on the left, we have Toodles Xmas Dream, which was given as a premium um, at a, at, uh, in dry goods stores in 1913. Uh, so, so if you spent a certain amount of money at the grocery, you would get this copy of Toodles Xmas Dream uh, that you could then give to your child. Now, once you've taken care of decorating your home and sending out your Christmas cards and shopping for the kids, you better prepare for your Christmas dinner. And, um, and Christmas dinner, of course, is, is the, the food around which we center our holidays. Um, so I, I just wanted to share with you some of the great advertisements from our, our newspapers collection. Um, here in the upper left-hand corner, the Bonnell Mercantile Company says the store will be open evenings until Christmas. So extended holiday hours are nothing new. Uh, in the lower right-hand corner, we had a, a market that carried uh, poultry, telling people to order their turkeys. Ducks and geese were very popular poultry items uh, back, in the, back in the 1910s, as well as chickens. In the center, uh, Fleasbach is now prepared for Christmas with a full line of staple and fancy groceries and candies. And, uh, and they also sold Christmas trees. So they have a, a, a section for Christmas trees, a center for Christmas dinner fixins, and then a section for Christmas candies. And then on the lower right, uh, we have an, uh, an advertisement for Walter East, which was in the Five Points neighborhood of Denver. And there uh, they specialized in pork products, saying that when in need of anything about a hog, except the squeal, come to Walter East, homemade lard and sausage, especially. Now, of course, you cannot forget the Christmas candy. 
And, um, and so here we have this ad for Masons from the, uh, the Chronicle News uh, in 1911. And, um, and in the lower right hand corner, a beautiful candy dish from our collection to put it in. Now, I promised you in the, in the advertisement for this program that I would tell you why candy companies could, could um, promote purity and cleanliness in their products. This is because of the FDA or the Food and Drug Administration. In the early 20th century, food, was food and drugs were unregulated. And a lot of manufacturers used dishonest practice to alter the food to make it less expensive to produce, but it was causing a lot of human damage. Um, uh, companies were doing things like adding talc, that is ground up rock, to baking powder because it, was, it would make the baking powder less expensive. Uh, they would, uh, dairy producers would add formaldehyde to milk to mask, um, to mask uh, a, a, cow, a, a cow disease that could uh, cause, um, could even cause death in children and, and people with, immuno, uh, with compromised Im um, immunity. And so really, and then of course, the, um, the famous example of uh, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle and the meatpacking industry. Uh, and so really, so in 1906, the Food and Drug Administration was formed to regulate, um, to regulate food, uh, certain food industries as well as drugs. And for some reason, candy companies fell under that. So candy companies after 1906 were actually able to, um, actually able to advertise the purity is guaranteed uh, or purity and cleanliness are hobby. So they're actually able to advertise that because they were, their industry was regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. Um, and, and, so, and so we see, uh, we see uh, national trends starting to affect local, uh, local activities and even purchasing a food or eating candy and things like that. Now, one of the things that, that folks uh, very often do, did and still do to this day are participate in, um, in religious services. And 19, the 1910s were no different. However, one of the things we start seeing in the 1910s that was different from the decades pr uh, prior to the 1910s was that we start seeing these nationalized um, practices like Santa Claus and, um, and more commercial products being included in, the, in holiday celebrations showing up in churches. So here, on the, um, here on, the, on the left, we see something that we might expect to be more traditional. Christmas at the churches, um, exercises and services were held, Christmas trees, Christmas programs, given Saturday night, make little folks happy. But maybe we don't expect to see the one on the right that says Santa Claus plans to visit many Montrose churches on Christmas Eve. And in fact, Santa Claus did do that, <coughs> excuse me. In, uh, in 1913, at, in Montrose, Santa stopped off at three different churches um, for, for the services. And the, uh, even the article on the left, which seems from the header to not include kind of the more commercial aspects of Christmas, actually did in its program. So the, the, the article goes on to say that some of the uh, program's offerings were Genevieve, Genevieve Pike, reciting a poem called Christmas Dolly, and the primary department, or the young children, singing the song Jolly Old St. Nicholas, complete with hand motions, both of which are, are non-religious things. Uh, Christmas Dolly is talking about a, a, a present or a gift, and Jolly Old St. Nicholas is talking about Santa Claus delivering gifts. So here we have even embedded within the Christmas service uh, at a, at a, at a um, Christian church, um, this commercial aspect emerging um, that's emerging during this time. This is also a time period of transition for those of the Jewish faith. Um, prior to the early, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, Hanukkah was a minor uh, Jewish uh, religion, or a minor Jewish festival. However, with the advent of this com nationally commercialized Christmas, we start seeing synagogues um, trying to respond to, um, trying to respond to this uh, nationalized Christmas as a holiday. Uh, by, by increasing the, the activity, their Hanukkah activities. So we start to see an increase by the late 1910s of things that look very similar to Christmas practices, but are for Hanukkah. 
So we have the annual Hanukkah ball that is advertised in the Denver, Denver Jewish News by 1920, uh, at which time they, they have a sumptuous, sumptuous kosher banquet and celebrate the uh, Hanukkah, the Feast of Lights. Um, the article notes that dancing will start at 8.30 and a full evening's good time is assured. And so, so we see this transition um, of Hanukkah being elevated in order to, um, in order to, give, to give Jewish uh, children and families an opportunity to participate in this nationalized culture, but in a way that works for their own personal faith. Okay. So all of the preparations leading up to uh, leading up to your 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 several days of Christmas celebration are all in place, and so now it's time to get ready for your Christmas party. So the first thing you want to do if you're the the lady of the house is is maybe you want to make sure that you have a good you know you have some nice hose, um, and so you can go to the you can go to the, the mercantile and pick out some Christmas hose as opposed to just regular hose. Uh, there actually isn't a difference, folks. Um, but but we're now we now see mercantiles, our department stores, specifically targeting um, Christmas as a reason to purchase clothing items. And then here we have a few things from our collection. We have the um, up in the upper uh, toward the upper left. We have this purple box, the Suprema Violet Face Powder. Most women did not yet wear cosmetics uh, in the 1910s, but face powder kind of evened things out. And so that was not cons really considered um, makeup. But of course, if you have gray hairs, you maybe want to get rid of those with a bottle of, you know, with your bottle of Cuban hair color restorer. Uh, no reason for gray hair, this advertisement claims. And this is a bottle of this Cuban hair color restorer from our collection. Okay, so now you need something to wear if you're the lady of the house. And so again, you've got an advertisement for uh, specifically for Christmas suits and dresses. Um, again, these would have just been things that would have been good for winter wear, but are being marketed for Christmas. Maybe you're going to make your own dress, uh, like from this pattern on the right from our collection. Uh, anyone who sews will, will notice the name at the top, that it's a McCall pattern. Uh, we still have McCall around today to, um, to get patterns from to make our, our holiday dresses. And then a, a spool of thread in the, in the upper right-hand corner. Let's look at some of the dresses that we have. Now, let me first of all say that some of the, most of these dresses belong to um, fairly wealthy women from the state of Colorado, um, but not all of them. So this first dress, we're gonna go from left to right. This first dress on the left actually was um, a Daniels and Fisher, for those of you uh, familiar with the department store, Daniels and Fisher. Um, this was actually made for Alice Coors of the Coors family. And, um, you know, we have this beautiful um, pale beige silk dress. It's, it's got uh, lace all over the collar and the, and the, uh, the bodice. Um, this beautiful, elegant uh, ball gown that would have been perfect for Christmas celebrations. The next, oops, excuse me. The next three are much more modern. You can see kind of this old Victorian neckline and, and kind of um, high bodice of the Victorian era left over in Alice Coors's dress. But the, the next three are much more modern. Um, the one next to it is this beautiful ivory silk gown. It's got, again, it still has lace netting on the bodice, um, but we start to see reflections of, of influence from Asia, which was very, very popular in the 1910s. So this, 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 where, what we, where we see this is on the waistline, where this, this weighted panel that, that starts high on the waist and wraps around to the back resembles the Japanese obi. And then the, the, the slightly longer draping sleeves look, more, look similar to kimono sleeves. And then finally in the back, the, it, the back of the gown falls to a fishtail train, which again is very similar to the Japanese kimono. The next dress, which is this uh, kind of brownish, um, this kind of brownish uh, bronze dress, what is actually a handmade dress. So this is one where they would have bought the pattern and made their dress. Um, it's got this beautiful blue slip, uh, silk slip underneath of it <clears throat> with, the, with the caramel colored or the, the bronze colored lace over the top um, with, with this caramel colored silk um, to attach to the corset. So again, we're seeing kind of like a visual drop in the neckline by having two different colors, but the neckline is actually still quite high. It just looks lower because of the two different colors. 
And then finally on the, finally on the end, we have a teak colored chiffon dress that's kind of this over, uh, chiffon over this chocolate covered satin. And you can see that chocolate color satin at the, at the base of the dress. Um, and so again, we have a, we have a lower neckline. Um, we have softer fabrics, um, the long sheer sleeves, and this. And, and if you look at all four dresses together, you will notice that none of the dresses are extraordinarily bright color. They're they're all in this kind of brown, beige, cream, ivory, pale, um, pale collection. Other than this, the other than that that bright green band across the second one, second to the left. And this is because um, commercial dyes were not yet um, were not um, yet available, highly available in the United States. Um, they were those commercial dyes were primarily made in Germany, and in the 1910s, particularly toward the, the particularly in the second half of the 1910s, Germany was at war um, in Europe, and uh, and so we weren't getting those dyes from Germany anymore. And so our 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 fabrics started to revert to more natural colors that were easier to get uh, to hold to the fabric, and that would last until uh, until after World War One. Had to throw in some shoes. Uh, again, we have advertisements specifically for Christmas shoes, but they wouldn't have been any different. Um, you could have worn these sensible boots in the upper, uh, upper uh, center to any party, or you could have gone with perhaps a fancier slipper, which is in the lower right. And men, of course, had Christmas shoes too, along with uh, tuxedo vests, uh, dress shirts, advertisements specifically for Christmas shirts, and this men's coat, which was sold in Leadville, but which was actually manufactured in Philadelphia. So we start seeing a, a much more national, um, you know, clothes, aren't, clothes may, uh, aren't necessarily made in Denver. Sometimes they are, uh, but, they're, but they're often shipped in from long distances. Finally, before we move away from clothes altogether, we need to stop off and take a look at the apron. Aprons were extraordinarily important for women at fancy parties all the way up until the 1970s. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing at the end if maybe anyone remembers they, uh, wearing aprons or their moms or grandmothers wearing aprons at, at fancy parties. Um, because uh, because the, the apron was very important to make sure that their dress stayed clean at the party while they were serving their guests. And actually the Elk Mountain pilot in November of 1918 said about the apron pattern on the left, one might as well expect Christmas to be observed without dinner as without the pretty tea aprons and serving aprons that help to make it joyous each year. That, and that, that text accompanied this pattern for a white muslin apron with a rickrack braid edge. Oops. I'm gonna pause for just a second here. Uh, thank you, Janet. Janet says she has aprons and wore one on Thursday. That's wonderful. And yes, thank you, Tamar. Also, we have an upcoming exhibit on aprons um, in, in the spring at History Colorado. Um, we love aprons at History Colorado. We really do. Um, so, so once you're ready, uh, once you have your outfit picked out and you're all ready to go, now you need to figure out how to plan your party. And planning your party was easier than ever in the 1910s because all of a sudden, lots and lots and lots of people started publishing books about how to plan parties in the 1910s. Um, first, I wanted to show you some, some, local, uh, some local books here that we have in that were, were printed in Colorado. Um, we have uh, church cookbooks, of course, How We Cook in Colorado, Choice Recipes Contributed by the Ladies of the First Baptist Church in Denver. Um, that's actually from 1907, but of course that would have been around in kitchens in the 1910s. We also have on the right the Colorado Department of Public Instructions book, A Book of Holidays. Um, that was printed here in Denver in 1913. And then finally, um, in the center, we have a book by Seymour S. Tibbles uh, recounting a fictional story of Christmas at Golden Gulch. So we've got, we've got all these entertainment books, and these entertainment books are very ready to tell us how to celebrate our holidays. And what, of course, menu planning, we've been to the market, menu planning is very important. So here we have, um, here we have a few things. Um, on the left, we have a full menu from the Ore Herald. They don't include any recipes. So presumably all of the things in this simple Christmas menu um, would, be, uh, would be well known to the readers of that article. 
Um, it, it includes oyster cocktail, cream of tomato soup, roast turkey, potato croquettes, creamed onions, cabbage salad on spinach leaves, plum pudding with hard sauce, white mountain cake, which if you, if you watch the, the advanced video, we make a white mountain cake in the video, and then uh, ending with uh, bonbons, crackers, cheese, and coffee. Uh, in the upper right hand kiss, uh, or uh, in the upper right hand corner, we have the honey molasses kisses from the Montrose Daily Press. And in the lower uh, center, um, we have a recipe for nut balls from the Ray Rattler in 1911. And if you actually look at this recipe, it's basically a recipe for cake pops. It says cut stale cake into inch squares, then cover them entirely with a frosting made as follows. Um, and so it's basically, they, they call them nut balls because it includes um, a little bit of nuts, roll, uh, roll, the, you roll the, the frosting in nuts, but they're essentially cake pops. Um, so I guess everything old, uh, everything new uh, comes from everything old. You would need place to store your cakes once you've made them for the, or, once you've made things for the party. We have a few things from our collection here. We have a pantry on the right, uh, we have a cake chest on the left, and a heart-shaped cookie cutter. You'd want to make sure you decorate your table. Your table needs to be beautiful for your holiday party. Uh, on the left, we have this beautiful table scarf, hand-embroidered table scarf. On the right, from uh, the book Dame Curtsy's Book of Novel Entertainments for Every Day in the Year, we have place card suggestions uh, for Christmas, uh, a star and uh, if for a quote unquote Dutch affair, a wooden shoe that you could, uh, you could trace and cut out and make placeholders for your guests. Of course, you wanna make sure you decorate your table with your fanciest china um, if you've got it. Uh, so anything from, um, and these were, all of these are plates that were manufactured in the 1910s. And you can see that there's a variety of patterns. They're almost all floral in nature, but they really have a wide range of um, styles. In the center, we have almost an Art Nouveau influence. Um, we've got kind of the English country in the lower left and the upper right. So we have kind of a, a, a wide variety of, of styles, but almost all floral. Now, one of the really cool things that you could have in the 1910s was a chafing dish that was electric. So if you had electricity in your house, you could actually buy this GE electric chafing dish and put something in it to keep it warm. Um, now, this advertisement, if you look in the back behind, uh, behind the young people, uh, it's actually uh, advertising the electric chafing dish to college students. You can see the pennants on the back wall and some of the other, other kind of things that you, that you would associate with college in the 1910s. But the electric chafing dish uh, was, uh, was something that if you had electricity in your home, it was a great novel thing to display at a party to show your guests. And this advertisement is from the Salida Mail from 1914. Now I mentioned before these books of entertaining and boy were they, uh, boy, were they uh, really popular in the 1910s. They really weren't around the decade before, but all of a sudden in the 1910s, these books come out and these books, again, help with this nationalizing culture. Because if I've got four different examples of these books up here. Um, they're written by four different people, all of them women, um, for entertaining for all occasions. Uh, uh, every, everything is for all occasions, for every day of the year. But if you read all four of them, their advice and their suggestions are all very, very similar. Um, and so, so we've got, we've got very, very similar advice being given across the board that you could buy a book in the bookstore. And even if you, no matter which of these four you picked, you're probably getting a similar advice to the other books, as well as people, similar advice to people all over the rest of the country. Now, in addition to the suggested entertainments in the books, we have other things in the home. Many of these entertainments are, so like in the books, they might say something like sing songs or recite poems or uh, put on plays. And then they give you examples of those things. And all of these things were common in the home. Um, on the right, or excuse me, on the left, I have, we have an image of one of our many player piano, or one of our many pianos that we have in our collection. Um, this really beautiful example um, of an upright piano. 
Um, in the 1910s, we also had player pianos. This, this uh, piano pictured is not, but we had player pianos as well. And in the upper left-hand corner is a player piano roll. So if you didn't know how to play the piano and there was nobody at your party who knew how to play the piano and you happen to have enough money to buy a player piano, you could have the piano just do the playing for you. However, in the 1910s, Almost every party had somebody, at least one person at it, who knew how to play the piano. And so sheet music, like this, uh, this song, uh, The Wild Rose, um, was very, very popular. Families who had pianos, people who played piano, would have, would have dozens and dozens of pieces of sheet music to be able to um, celebrate really any occasion, no matter the time of year. And people love to sing together. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Meet Me in St. Louis, which is one of my favorites, um, you, they, uh, at the party, they're all uh, singing with, with the piano. Um, and so, uh, and so this sheet music was actually sold at the Silver State Music Store in Pueblo. Now, in the, by the 1910s, the Victrola also existed. So if you didn't have a piano of any type, nobody needed to know how to play music at all, because you could have a Victrola, which is basically a record player. Um, and that we have one in the upper right hand corner here. It, it looks like a piece of furniture that was done intentionally uh, so that it would kind of fade into the family's house, uh, home. And then in the lower right corner, we have an advertisement from the Knight Campbell Music Company of Denver, Colorado, asking the reader, where that will there be a Victrola in your home this Christmas? So these parties, um, these Christmas parties that people had, much, very much like we do today. Um, you know, today we have a party and we maybe post pictures about it on Facebook or Instagram or we tweet about it. Um, and so, and so. The people who we're friends with on Facebook or our followers on, on Instagram or Twitter know what we did for the holidays. Exact same thing happened in the 1910s, except people submitted that to the newspaper and then the newspaper ran a little article. So, so here I've just pulled out a sampling from papers all over the state of Colorado um, that, uh, that talk about people enjoying Christmas time together. Mr. and Mrs. E.E. E. Stevenson made the day pleasant for friends at a Christmas dinner party at their ranch. Those present were John Cole, wife and daughters, E.W. Ewing, Max Ewing, Fred Vertrees, and John M. James. Another says, at the close of the evening, a large red stocking was brought in and from it, each member drew out a gift. The matrons were assisted by Mrs. Farmer's charming little daughters, Mrs. Genevieve and Dorothy. And another, uh, Miss, Mrs. B.F. Wire and granddaughter, Miss Blanche Baker, were hostesses on Sunday at a Christmas dinner given at the residence of Mrs. Wire on Fifth Street. These guests were Mr. and Mrs. A.B. Wire and family of Delta, and Mr. and Mrs. H.J. Pomeroy and family of Palisade. Now, occasionally, there are times where no matter what we want to do, we don't get to celebrate Christmas in the way we're expecting it. Or excuse me, I should say celebrate our holidays in the way we're expecting it. And I wanted to include this, um, this not only because I just find it fascinating, but also because we're kind of coming up against that this year. And, um, and so I, I think it's, I, I like to be comforted a little bit in the thought that this is not the first time that this has happened. So in 1913, Colorado experienced the heaviest snowfall it's ever had. 45.7 inches of snow fell on Denver in two days. And from the Daily Journal of Telluride, uh, reporting on December 5th, 1913, the reporter noted, the storm in all its fierceness is still raging in all sections of Denver and traffic of all kinds is almost completely paralyzed. Men and women were unable to battle and plow through the deep drifts, being forced to spend the night in downtown hotels and lodging houses and in the police station on cots or on the floor. The city auditorium was also crowded with those seeking refuge. In the 1913s, one of the, one of the other things that happened during the, great, during this, uh, the snowstorm was that the Denver Tramway Company, which ran uh, cable cars through Denver, uh, a lot of their cable cars, unsurprisingly, got stuck in the snow. 
Um, on the left, we have one of the Denver tramway cars stuck in snow and ice on 16th between Welton and Glen Arm on, in Denver. And on the right, we have an intrepid railroad employee uh, attempting to figure out how to dig out this particular tram car um, just outside of, of the Denver city limits. And all in all, 210 streetcars were marooned all over the city of Denver. Cars, automobiles, you know, fairly new, uh, fairly new uh, in the 1910s, were also stuck all over the city. And as a result, uh, one newspaper noted, the grocers and dairymen are unable to make any deliveries. And as a result, the babies in many sections of the city are suffering. Here on the left, we have an automobile stuck at 15th and Stout in Denver. On the right, we have people going back to what they knew before automobiles. If you, if most people still had horses around or could borrow horses. And here we have a photograph of a milk delivery man making his rounds, delivering milk uh, with, with a, uh, walking his horse on the snow covered street of Denver. And they're actually right in front of the Broadway Hotel on Broadway and 15th Street in Capitol Hill. Uh, and written on the back of the photo, it says, the way they delivered after the storm. People had fun too, you know, if you're stuck in the snow, you might as well enjoy it. And uh, once hundreds of laborers worked to clear out the streets, reported one, uh, one newspaper, people ventured out. Schools were closed, so children made snowmen and adults crunched through the snow in Civic Center Park. Uh, we've got a, a snowman on the, on the left side. Uh, there's a, a sign in front of it that says, it's a privilege to live in Colorado, and the snowman is holding a whiskey bottle. On the right, uh, we have uh, adults uh, and children playing in the snow uh, in front of the Capitol and in Civic Center Park. Now, whereas people in Denver may have uh, felt stumped by the snow, uh, in Weld, out in Weld County, people actually uh, were excited about it. So the, you, can see, uh, you can see from the Raymer Enterprise, which is 70 miles east of Fort Collins, uh, this newspaper article from the right they responded a little differently than the, the newspapers in Denver. It says snow, some wet, blizzard also, it's tough on range stock, pen points for sale at this office. Pen points being the tip of the pen for, um, for fountain pens. So they were overly excited about the snow. Um, here we have a picture on the left of um, Stanley, uh, the, um, the Hightower Homestead. Um, of the, Stanley, the uh, Stanley family home, where Uncle Vern Stanley was tunneling out in search of a spade to dig through the snowbank so that the door would open and they would see daylight again. Um, and, uh, and the Raymer Enterprise also reported, the farmers are jubilant over the storm and estimate that enough snow has already fallen to make water enough to irrigate 10,000 acres of land next summer, thus assuring a bountiful Colorado crop for 1914. So I guess snow is all in the eye of the beholder. Leadville, of course, reported a little differently. They didn't get most of the snow, but they were used to snow in Leadville. Uh, their headline was, is winter here? Yes, thank you. Um, and the, rep the paper reported uh, that the storm uh, in Le that Leadvillers in general last night bundled up in great coats and plowed through over a foot of snow, the season's first actual winter offering. The article continued to go on saying, sleigh bells rang cheerily, store and office boys became the most active individuals in the street, and well-known poet Fluke McGoop was seized with inspiration and burst into the Herald Democrat office at midnight with a poem. Now, apparently his poem was not welcome because the, the article cl concluded by noting that since this was his first winter, or his first offense this winter, Fluke McGoop was allowed to light gently in a snowbank some 20 feet from the office. So it sounds to me like they kind of chucked him out of the office and threw him into a snowbank. Now, of course, 12 inches wasn't all that much for Leadvillers, um, so they, they responded a little differently than, the, uh, than what the almost four feet that they got in Denver. So what do you do if you don't get to actually celebrate your holidays in person with your friends and family? Well, in the 1910s, there was actually a, an off, a, a, not, a, not a brand new um, invention, but one that was starting to be brand new in people's homes. And that is the telephone. Um, 
prior to the early 20th century, people had access to phones. There was often, you know, a phone in town somewhere, um, or they shared a phone or something like that. Um, but by the 1910s, more and more people were starting to get them in their homes, and advertisements for them was starting to change. So here on the right, we have a Western Electric telephone box that was removed from the Paramount Apartments in Denver. Um, this was a shared phone that would have been in the lobby for use by any of the residents. But on the world of, in 1911, and the article on the, in the upper right-hand corner shows a picture of a man and a child, and in the upper right-hand corner, an older woman. And the text reads, hello, is that you, mother? Merry Christmas. And she responds, thank you, son, a Merry Christmas to you and yours. How's baby? He replies, fine, right here at my knee. Says, tell drama Merry Christmas for me. She replies, bless you all. It's so thoughtful of you to call me up. The next best thing to having you with me is the sound of your voice. And then the text goes on to read, the sound of your voice, that's the keynote. Make some loved one happy this glad Christmas day by the sound of your voice. Call up mother, wife, sister, or sweetheart over the long distance lines and wish her a Merry Christmas. Do your part to make someone happier by the sound of your voice and we'll do ours. And this is an advertisement for the Mountain States Telephone and Telegraph Company offering half price rates for calls on Christmas morning. So even when we don't get to be together, we still can find ways to be together, whether it's, whether it's uh, 2020 or whether it's 1910. And then that concludes, um, that concludes the, the presentation part. Um, the one thing I would like to mention, which is a brand new thing we're offering with Historical Table this time around, is that tomorrow you will get a follow-up email from us um, that will include a survey that we'd like you to fill out telling us how we did with the program tonight. Um, there'll be a link to donate if you wanted to, to, um, to add to the price of what you've already paid for your ticket tonight. But in addition to those things, um, and as well as telling you about upcoming programs and ways you can sign up to learn more about what we're offering, we are going to be sending each and every one of you a virtual party planning kit. The virtual party planning kit is going to, um, let me, actually let me stop sharing my screen here for a second so I can see those of you who are on camera a little better. Okay, um, so the virtual party planning kit is going to include lots of things that we talked about tonight, but what it's going to do is it's going to, uh, from start to finish, help you plan your own virtual Zoom holiday party from the 1910s. So the recipes we talked about tonight, costume ideas, activity ideas, um, all of that is going to be included in the kit. There's going to be Zoom backgrounds. Thank you very much um, to Katie and Michalina, whether or not they're here, they helped me um, put together a really beautiful package um, for you to be able to celebrate your own party ideas at home. So, um, so t keep your eye out for that email coming from us tomorrow, which will include all of those ideas. If you do the party, let me know how it goes, please. Um, because what I'd love to do is I'd love to not just have a, a holiday party, but what about a Chuck Wagon dinner party? Or what about an app 1960s app race ski Aspen dinner party? Or um, all sorts of other kind of party ideas that we can do um, that we have in our archives and our collections that we would love to put together for you. So your feedback on this will be really important for us to be able to get the, the next one even better for you. Um, so that's going to be coming up uh, to you tomorrow. And, um, and so now I'm going to open it up to questions. What questions do you have for me? Um, uh, Tamar, were there any, I just want to make sure that there weren't questions um, that came. I'm just going to go ahead and scroll back through. Um, I talked about Janet's aprons. Um, yes, Melissa, um, I, I did search frosting because frosting is the most important part of a cake, right? Um, so my search results were from searching for frosting when I showed the nut ball recipe. Um, and uh, Joe and Angie say that their grandparents had a player piano. Uh, that's really cool. Um, I love that idea. Um, what is hard sauce? Uh, Kathy asks, what is hard sauce? Hard sauce is a... Um, it's kind of a glaze made with liquor. Um, so it's, it's a glaze that you pour over a cake um, or serve with a, a Christmas pudding um, that is um, very heavy 
uh, liquor content. Uh, normally brandy, um, normally brandy. And what basically what it does is it let you, is that it, it's br basically brandy and syrup, or um, uh, excuse me, brandy and sugar. And then you can pour it over your Christmas pudding. Um, and then you can, it, it actually has just enough, uh, you, you cook down the, you cook it down a little bit, but there's just enough alcohol left in that you can pour it over the top of your Christmas pudding and light it on fire. So if you've ever seen basically any version of the Christmas Carol where they like set their Christmas pudding on fire, um, with like a little little piece of holly in the top and then it just has like a little bit of like flame glowing over it. It's because they've poured the hard sauce over the top. Other questions? You know what? I think, I think Raggedy Andy was in the stories. Um, <laughs> Excuse me, the question is from Catherine. She asks, she says, Raggedy Ann dolls have endured for years. I actually have a Raggedy Ann doll. I was going to bring her out for the presentation, but I forgot to have her sitting on, sitting out here with me before, um, before it started. The question is, do you know when Andy entered the picture? Andy was in the stories in the 1920s. And so um, I'm going to guess that the doll version of Andy showed up in the 1920s as well. Um, Paige says she made the honey fluff candy last night and they had a great time. Uh, and Janet also did. Um, I thought that was a really fun recipe. Um, I, I hadn't heard of honey fluff candy before and so I thought it would be kind of a fun thing to do. Um, I guess the one thing I can mention uh, since there aren't any pressing questions uh, after honey fluff candy is that the white mountain cake, for those of you that didn't get a chance to watch the video yet, white mountain, mountain cake just shows up in like every Colorado newspaper in the 1910s. And the origin is actually New Hampshire. It's named after the White Mountain range of New Hampshire. However, it makes total and perfect sense that Coloradans would love a cake called White Mountain Cake because it's White Mountains, right? Um, and then when you finish making the cake, it actually looks like a mountain, kind of like a mountain. It's lumpy and it's got, you know, white on the top of it. And, um, and so it's really, I thought that was a really fun cake. I tried four or five different recipes because cake recipes from the 1910s don't often give exact amounts of things or they don't tell you the temperature or how long to bake it for. Um, I had two different recipes, one called only for egg whites, the other one called only for egg yolks. Um, the egg yolk one turned out to be like uh, cornbread, which I mean, cornbread's great. I'm from Iowa originally, so I love cornbread, but a cornbread cake, no, not so much. So. I wasn't going to subject you all to that. I wanted to try them out before I, um, before I, I guarantee you, before I put one in the video. Um, but I'm devoted to all of you and I wanted to make sure that I gave you a good cake. So um, Tamar asks, uh, why the 1910s? How does it compare to other eras of the holidays in Colorado? Well, I picked the 1910s for a couple of reasons. One very practical, um, because I wanted to be able to do the kit for everyone. Um, I needed to make sure that as, an, as a curator, we need to make sure that we're not violating copyright. And so I needed to go before 1927. Is that right? That, is that the right year this year, 1927? I needed to go before the copyright cut off to make so that I could share kit, um, that wouldn't be violating that. So that was a practical reason. However, I myself, my master's thesis is set, is I was on the American Arts and Crafts Movement, which was in the 1900s and the 1910s. And so I'm very familiar with that period. And one of the things that happens during that period is this transition to kind of a national culture because of advertising and because of commercially made products. That if you live in Montrose or Delta or Pueblo or Denver, you're getting the same products as you would if you were in Iowa or Georgia or New Hampshire or Oregon. Um, and so we see this kind of nationalization um, and, and Sean's chipping in. Thank you, Sean. Uh, don't forget the moving of stuff like presents with railroads, trucks, et cetera, was a big deal starting in the 1910s, right? So we have, we have automobiles that are able to move these things around. Train systems are really great. We have the Sears catalogs, the Montgomery Ward catalogs that are going out to every single farm because of rural free delivery. Um, rural free delivery allowed for free delivery to farms. And so people on farms could get a whole house if they wanted to um, I, by, by mail. 
And, uh, and so we, we see this kind of nationalized culture start emerging and that a, a Christmas comes into that. So we see kind of this nationalized version of Christmas. And I really, I wanted to focus on that because if I stepped aside from that and I looked at ethnic and religious and cultural traditions, I wouldn't be able to do, I, I didn't, didn't feel I'd be able to do due diligence to all of them that are represented in the state of Colorado in a 50 minute presentation. So I thought, well, let's look at what's affecting those by looking at this nationalized stuff that's kind of coming to like settle over the top of the top of that. Any other questions? Uh, Jenny asks, do you think the widening of this national Christmas culture has continued in a linear way since the 1910s or has it ebbed at points? That's a great question. Um, Definitely the Great Depression slowed things down really hard, um, as did World War II rationing um, and shortages. So we see, we, we see, if not kind of a static uh, movement. So 1910s, we start to see it grow. 1920s, huge peak, um, particularly in urban areas. Rural areas kind of goes the other way because a lot of farmers were in an agricultural depression in the 1920s. And then in the 30s, it, in 40s, it kind of hits everybody. But by the, by the mid 1950s, we really see it skyrocket again. So lots more people have a lot higher disposable incomes and it just kind of goes whoop with the commercial, the commercial aspect. The 1970s, we see it contract again when people start thinking about environmentalism and um, resource scarcity, um, gas prices, uh, you know, the oil embargoes in the 1970s, um, change transportation costs and make goods more expensive. So we kind of see that contraction. Um, and so, yeah, there's definitely, we definitely see those kind of ebb and flow periods, um, the way that this Christmas has nationalized. And, and really like the last 30 years, we've seen a lot more people stepping away from this nationalized idea and starting to like, bring back ethnic traditions and faith-based traditions and um, cultural traditions as well. Um, and then Louise asks, I wonder what Christmases were like during the 1918 flu. You know, I don't know. I, I, the, the newspapers are really silent about it. Um, I, I did look, uh, and, but, um, but I, I, we kind of have a deficit of, of you know, those kind of events during, during that period. Um, Cause that definitely was between the two peaks of, of the 1918 flu, you know, the, the first October peak and then the, the early 1919 peak. So um, yeah, so Tamar said that a similar question was asked in the research center about Thanksgiving. And yes, the silence on this is curious. I mean, it's very possible that like, they reacted very much like we are this year where they weren't like you couldn't go anywhere you want or you didn't want to go anywhere because you wanted to protect yourself and your loved ones and so forth. Um, and so there was just kind of a, a rapid contraction during that one year. Um, yeah, any other questions. Thank you all for thank you all for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, I really uh, I had fun putting this together and, and doing the video and everything. And like I said, keep a lookout for that email tomorrow. And if you do the party, please let me send drop me an email and let me know how it goes because um, I'd love to do more of these for you. Um, thank you, everybody. Have a great night.